what you will find is that if you're going to understand it or go to any uh, meaningful depth, you're going to have to be able to read it through the lenses of the Hebrew people. Because it's about a Hebrew Messiah. It is about Israel and the prophets and the priests. And all these people were Jewish people. And so uh, when you know the traditions, and especially when you travel to Israel, you read the Bible in a, a whole different light. All right. Well, happy birthday to you, uh, Ahuva, and thank you for the blessing. Um, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Judges chapter 1, and we're going to finish with that tonight. But Judges chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up in verse 22. And we're going to go all the way down to chapter 2, verse 6 tonight. And by the way, I don't think, Eric, is this your first time here, you guys? It's not, okay. And you're from Austin, Texas. That's right. I remember you were here. That's right. That's Austin, Texas. That's right. Who's a Cowboys fan? <laughs> Nobody. I think we have one Cowboy fan. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Didn't mean to bring division, but sports always does. All right. Um, so what I wanted to talk about tonight, of course, the Old Testament is all about Israel and the 12 tribes of Israel and like that. And they've been such a, an example to us, sometimes a good example, sometimes a bad uh, example. And the New Testament tells us that we are to learn from that uh, example. So I wanted to propose a question to you guys uh, tonight. And the question is very simply this, what would your life look like if you gave all of your life to God? I'm assuming, of course, that we haven't given all of our life to God. What would your life look like if you gave all of your life to God? And I'm talking about your whole life and will turned over to Jesus Christ. If you're in recovery, what would your recovery look like? If you're married, what would your marriage look like? If you have children, what kind of children would you be raising? What would they look like? What would they be like? If you're single and you're looking for a spouse... What would your spouse, your perfect spouse, be like? Do you even know? Have you any idea? And what about your job or career? If you gave your whole life to Jesus Christ, what would your job and your career be like? Uh, your health. What would your health be like? Would you be sickly? Would you be healthy? Would you be a track star? What would your health be like? What's your health look like now? Very important question. And if you're in ministry, what would your ministry be like? It's an important question that pastors ask themselves all, of, all the time. If I gave my whole life to Christ, what would my ministry be like? And then, of course, we want to ask the question, what would your life look like if you lived a compromised life? That is a life that is not entirely given over to Jesus Christ. Well, in Judges chapter 1, verses 22 to chapter 2, verses 6, there is a picture there that reveals uh, both a compromised and an uncompromised Christian lifestyle. Both a compromised and an uncompromised Christian lifestyle. And that's what we want to talk about here uh, tonight. So if you look at verse 22, Judges chapter 1, verse 22... It says, And the house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. Now when it talks about the house of Joseph, it's very interesting. We don't have time to go all the way into it tonight. But it's referring to the half-tribe of Ephraim and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Some of you are nodding your head. You already know that. And so when Joseph went into Egypt and then his family followed, Joseph got married there and he had two children of his own. So when Jacob came later and he was 110 years old on his deathbed, he said, Joseph, bring all your brothers so I can pour out a blessing on them. Very similar to the way Ahubo just blessed us. And he blessed each one of them. He pronounced a blessing on each one of them. A variety of blessings. Some of them a little difficult. <clears throat> but then he came to Ephraim and Manasseh. And he said, Joseph, he said, Ephraim and Manasseh are going to take your place. They will be a half tribe and a half tribe. And he blessed them. Which is very interesting when I ask you the question, how many tribes of Israel were there? Were there 12 or were there 13? 
Because the names are used interchangeably as you read through the Old Testament. And guess what? Because the New Testament mirrors the Old Testament, I'm not a bit surprised. If I ask you the question, how many apostles were they? Were there 12 or were there 13? Most people immediately are going to say 12. But if you read the book of Acts, they chose by lot a guy by the name of Matthias. Later on, that's who they chose. Later on, God chose Paul. Are there 12 or are there 13? Interesting question. We'll know the answer when we get to heaven. Because in heaven, there are 12 pearly gates that have the name of each of the 12 tribes written on top of them. And then there's 12 foundations, and on the 12 foundations are written the names of 12 apostles. We'll know when we get there, if they're 12 or 13, right? But that's what the Bible is talking about whenever it refers to the tribe of Joseph or the house of Joseph. It's Joseph's two sons. Verse 23, it says, So <clears throat> the house of Joseph sent men to spy out Bethel, the city. The name of the city was formerly Luz. And when the spies saw a man coming out of the city, they said to him, Please show us the entrance to the city and we will show you mercy. So he showed them the entrance to the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man and all his family go. And the man went to the land of the Hittites, built the city, and called its name Luz, which is its name to this day. So this city of Bethel was like most cities in those days. <clears throat> it was surrounded by a wall. If you go with us to Israel and you see the old city of Jerusalem... You're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. They're surrounded by tall and thick walls to keep the enemies from, from penetrating the city in times of war. And then many of them had secret entrances. And they're very difficult to find, again, to confuse the enemy. And so the spies are there and they're watching and they see this guy come out of the city. So they go to him and then he informs where the entrance is at. At that point, the spies say, listen, thank you very much. Just to show you how much we appreciate your help. You and your family will not be harmed when we invade the city. And you would think that this guy would be grateful. You would think that he would inquire. I mean, to give up this information, he must have heard about these Hebrew people. He must have heard about how many cities they'd already taken and how many powerful kings they already conquered. And most importantly, who their God was. Hey, the guy would be grateful. The people showed me grace. The people showed me mercy. They're going to let me and my family just tiptoe out of here before they destroy this whole city, right? But no, what happens is this guy is like so many people today that experience God's grace, God's love, and God's mercy. But instead of joining God's family, what they do is they go build a replica of the sin that God had destroyed. Think about that. Consider that when you see people come around, they're all fired up about Jesus. Usually it's at a time of need in their life. But when the need is met, they just waltz right out of here to go rebuild what God had intended to destroy. It's why He allowed the hardship in the first place. But people do that. People are very fickle that way. And so this whole picture that we see here is like repeating the same mistakes and expecting different results. You've heard people say that that's the definition of insanity. Repeating the same mistakes, expecting different results. Or if you're in recovery, it's like people who come into recovery and they claim to have worked the first step. But in reality, they're just trading addictions. You've seen it. Let go of the drugs. They're addicted to sex. Let go of the drugs, they're addicted to food. Let go of the drugs, they're addicted to gambling. And on and on and on it goes. And they never seem to quite get into the second and third step. Where they turn their whole life, and it must be your whole life, over to the care of God. And so they just go about trading addictions and trading addictions and trading addictions. And they call it recovery. They call it spiritual growth. But is it really? It's just substitutes. It's counterfeits, right? There's a lot of people that do that. If we ever get to the second and third step, if we ever get to the place where we realize that we're uh, repeating the same mistakes and expecting different results, then what happens is we can turn our whole life 
over to the Lord and it must be our whole life. And here's why. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus said, No one, that is me, that is you, that is anybody, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. I know so many people who are making so many horrible choices. And when they call me to counsel with them, I can see it almost right away. All the symptoms are there. They've got one foot in the Lord and they got one foot in something else. And they say that they're trying to find balance. There is no balance. It is all Jesus or it is nothing at all. I didn't make the rules, but that's what it is. Compromise is just going to hurt you. And here's the thing, as you read through the Bible, one of the things you begin to discover is that the enemy loves compromise. Loves compromise. You know why? Because compromise allows him to come into your life little by little, so subtly, until you become like the frog in the kettle. You guys ever heard the one about the frog in the kettle? They say, I haven't done it, I love animals. But they say that if you put a frog in a kettle of water that is room temperature, he'll just stay there. And then you turn up the flame just a little bit, the water warms. And now the frog gets very comfortable. You turn up the flame a little more, the water is warmer now. Now the frog falls asleep. When the water begins to boil, the frog is floating because he is now dead. He could have jumped out. But the heat that was coming into the water was so subtle, he didn't realize that his life was going to be taken. And that's why Satan loves it when we compromise. He just turns up the heat a little bit, then a little bit more, then a little bit more. It might start out with a lie. It might start out with, you name the deceit. But once it begins, he has you. He loves it. He loves it. Somebody was reminding me last week that he's the angel of light. Sometimes we think of him with a pitchfork and a goat's head and very evil. No, no, he's an angel of light. He comes wearing many beautiful disguises. Well, how do I know him or how can I tell if, if he's deceiving me? How can I tell if the flame is, 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 turn, is, is turning up in my life? Right here. If you're into this every day, you will recognize it in a moment. If you're not, then you're like the wolf. Back in the days of the shepherds in Israel, you're like the, I'm sorry, you're like the sheep that is wandering around the fringes of the other sheep. Just laughing it up, jumping up and down, having a good time. And right as the sun is coming down and things get a little bit dark, the wolves come and devour that sheep. You got to be in the middle. You got to be in the middle where it's safe, close to the shepherd. The way you do that is you're in the Word. If you're not in the Word, listen, there is no compromise that is going to serve you. You're in the danger zone. In the danger zone. And you're going to find yourself living a life of compromise. And it won't be good. So that is a picture of what happened to Israel 3,000 years ago. And listen... It is happening to Christians today all over the place. That's why God in all His wonderful love and wisdom said in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. God is warning you. The devil is smarter than you are. You are not smarter than him. And the Bible says that God has a plan for your life. So does the devil. If you don't think that's true, you're, you're, you're kidding yourself. All right? You're just you're fooling yourself. It is true. Well, when it came to, to war, okay? When it came to war, the Israelites decided that it was time to compromise. And we're going to get into it more as we continue in these verses. But in verses 27 to verse 36, what we see is the end result of God's people who decided it would be better to compromise with the enemy than to drive them out. 
It's better for me to learn to live with my character defects than to recognize them, give them to God, and with courage, chop them off at the neck. It's better for me to live ignorantly than to look at what's really going on in my life and how it contrasts with the Word of God and just go on blindfolded or like the frog in the kettle. Is it easier? I think it is. But what's the alternative? It's not like we have, you know, 10 options, right? It is Satan and it is God all, all day long. So, verse 27, let's see what happens to these guys. It says, however, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shan. And if you go with us to Israel, we're going to visit Beth Shan. You'll see that city for yourself. And its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblim and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, will visit Megiddo as well. For the Canaanites, the ancient enemy of God's people, were determined to dwell in the land. Listen to me. <laughs> Listen to me. Of course the enemy is determined to dwell in your life. You're a fool if you think otherwise. But we're also supposed to be determined. Just as determined. And listen, our part is very easy. All we got to do is keep showing up. You get slapped, you fall down, get up and continue. So the enemy is determined. Like, oh, he's determined? Oh my gosh, it says it in the first page. You didn't know that? But you also have to be determined. Right? With our hand and God's hand, we move forward. And it came to pass, oh man, when Israel was strong, that they put the Canaanites out of the city? No, under tribute, but did not completely drive them out. So tribute is taxation. So when they got strong, they had the option now. Maybe when they got there, they were too weak. They said, oh, there's too many. But you know what? In a couple of years, we'll train our military. We'll get it going and we'll drive them out. No. They grew. They, 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 they trained their military. And when they could drive them out, they said, you know what? It might be a better idea to tax them. I could use the money. Can you use the money? Yeah. Why drive them out? Man, there's some profit to be made here. Is what they did, right? Now, I want to make clear. God understands the concept of process. I'm going to say it again. God understands the concept of process. I might be one of the few pastors that you'll hear say that. Because a lot of them want you delivered tonight in the name of Jesus. And I don't know of anybody that that has happened to. I know of many people that have entered the process and they begin to grow and mature. God is down with process. Jesus walked with the disciples for three years. After three years, they were not the same people they were when they first met them, when they first met them. So God understands the concept of the process. But He also knows that we are supposed to grow at some point. He understands process, but we got to grow at some point. And we need to learn from our mistakes, not repeat our mistakes. If that's the case, something is terribly wrong, right? The Israelites didn't learn. Look at verse 28. Again, it says, The Israelites became strong. Instead of getting rid of them, they compromised and they went for taxation as opposed to driving them out. A lot of people do that. They say, you know, why should I get rid of all my character defects? Why should I cut off my sin? There's some money to be made here. I can profit in one way. God knows, man, that I, if I become a full Christian, this girl that I'm in love with, she's going to leave me. This guy that I'm in love, he's going to leave me if I give my whole life to God. Or, like Eli, if you go to work and you say, listen, something is wrong here and I'm a Christian, you could lose your job. Yes, you are a Christian at great risk. But God is the one who will determine your life. It's called faith. Right? So, <clears throat> if the God of the Bible is your God, you listen to this, compromise is not going to work for you. If your God is the God of the Bible, compromise is not going to work for you. 
Now, <clears throat> if you're a politician, go compromise. If you're a Buddhist, if you believe that the universe is God, your higher power, all that, go compromise, it's fine. It'll work for you. You're going you're gonna to wreck at the end, but until you get there, it's going to work for you, or seemingly. But if your God is the God of the Bible, compromise will not work for you. And I'm always amazed at the younger people. I was young once, <clears throat> and I thought that my way compromise or whatever in many areas of my life would work for me. I thought that for many years. I'm young. You know, I was such a fast. I was telling Lorenzo the other day, he's into sports. I was such a fast runner. And I could, I had such athletic ability. I, I should have been an athlete. Not, I went to drugs, but if I'd have been an athlete, I might have, you know, done something. But I could leap over a fence that was six or eight feet tall. Without touching the links, I would put my hands and lift my body zoop, and jump right over. Saved my life many times. I, I had an open wound right here from the little things on top of the fence one time. They had to stitch me up. But I could do that. And I could run. You could not catch me. You could. I don't care if you were a cop and you just finished the academy. You could not catch me. Seriously. Serious. I was very talented in, 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 in that way. I, believe me. <laughs> And I thought to myself, con unconsciously, I'm invincible, man. Nothing can happen to me. And yeah, I mean, I guess there's Christians and I guess there's the Bible and all that stuff. But I'm fine. And I'm young. And I'm strong. And if there is such a thing as getting old, that's like way down the line. Not so. Not so. But young people think that way. So young people say, I, you know, I'm compromising, but not really. And, and I, I can do it for now because anyway, I mean, I'm, you know, what am I? I'm in my teens. I'm in my 20s. I'm in my early 30s. It's going to catch up to you. It's going to catch up to you. you. You could be a young frog in the kettle or an old frog in the kettle. You're still a frog in the kettle. And the same applies to the old people as well as the young people. But compromise will never work. Look, look what happens here. Verse 29. Oh my goodness. So sad. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer. So the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Nor did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalol. So the Canaanites dwelt among them and were put under tribute. Okay, so you taxed them, but you didn't drive them out. Nor did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko, or the inhabitants of Sidon, or Haleb, or Akzib, or Hilba, or Afik, and all of these weird names. So the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Nor did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. Or the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but they dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemeth and Beth Anath were put under tribute to them. And then look at these poor, uh, the poor tribe of Dan. It says, And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains. You got to get this again. Hebrew lenses here helps. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down to the valley. And the Amorites were determined to dwell in Mount Harris, in Ahalon, and Shalibim. Yet when the strength of the house of Joseph became greater, they were put under tribute. Still didn't drive them out. Now the boundary of the Amorites was from the ascent of Akrabim, from Selah, and upward. What a sad, sad picture. Because every tribe that is mentioned here compromised and they paid a great Price, especially the tribe of Dan. Let me paint a picture for you. So you have these beautiful, green, fertile valleys. And then you have, if you go to the San Gabriel Mountains, you can see what I'm talking about. You have these cliff, jagged edge cliff mountains on top of granite, right? And you're a farmer. And you're a rancher. Do you want to be in the green fertile valley? Or do you want to be up on the hillside trying to make something grow, trying to find a blade of grass to feed one of your sheep? You want to be in the fertile valley. God wanted to give them the fertile valley. Why weren't they there? Because they compromised. And whenever we compromise as children of God, we end up being the loser. 
So there they are in the valley, looking down every day at all of these foreign nations that worship foreign gods, and their sheep are so fat, and the tomatoes and the grapes are just coming up like crazy, and they're starving on the hillside. Compromise doesn't get it. God wanted to give His people so much, but because they compromise with the enemy, they end up with only about 10% of what God wanted to give them. I'm going to say it again. Because Israel compromised, they didn't receive and embrace and apply the instructions of God. They compromised. Because they compromised, they ended up with approximately... 10% of what God wanted to give them. Some of us tonight are saying prayers of gratitude to God. And we're enjoying what we have. But listen to me. You only have 10% of what God wants to give you because there's compromise in your life. In Genesis chapter 15, verses 18 through 20, it says that the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying... To your descendants, Abraham, to the Israelites, right? I have given this land, check it out, from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. That is a large chunk of land. I'm going to show you in a minute. In Genesis 17 verse 8, God said, Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger and the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. Let me show you what that looks like. Can you put that map up there? That's not the map. That's not the one. Nope. Oh, man. I emailed you guys a different map and you put up the wrong one. Oh, all right. So, in the Middle East, okay, Israel is a small little corner. They say that Israel is... 1% of 1% of the entire Middle East. Okay. Put that map up again. So, there is Israel right here. Just that little sliver right there is all it is. In the map that I wanted to show you, you would see that according to the word that God gave Abraham, they were to take all of that, all the way, all the Sinai, all the way to Egypt was supposed to be theirs. They end up with that little piece of land. It's about the size of New Jersey. You're going to see it when you get there. You're going to say, so Mario, we went all the way from the north to the south already? Yep, that's it. Mario, it's a small place. And how about the width? Very small. Mario, why? Why? Well, remember when we were in the book of Judges, we talked about how they compromised? That's why. That's why. So my question to you is if this map was your life, how much could you say that you've possessed in your marriage, in your career, in your finance, in your recovery, in your ministry, in all of these things? Have you taken the whole land that God has wanted to give you because you refuse to compromise? Or do you just take the little piece? Because you've compromised. It's a good question that we want to ask ourselves. Something you want to talk about meditation, meditate on that one, right? And so, <clears throat> the thing is, if you compromise, you get ripped off. Bottom line. Bottom line. And you can go through life and you can say, you know, I'm grateful for my little two bedroom, one bath house. And I tell God all the time that I'm grateful. And I'm going to say to you, it's a cop out, man. It's a cop out. Come on, I'm your pastor. I've counseled with you. You know that you compromise here and you compromise there. And there was divorce and there was alimony and there was child support and domestic violence and all these things. And you had been coming to church, but you didn't apply the word. Now you're there. God has so much for you. But you live in this little world now because of compromise. Right? So we never want to do that. Compromise just rips us off. So if compromise has ripped you off, you still breathing? Everybody still breathing? Everybody, eyes still open? Okay, you're still alive, right? Okay. Because the, the people in the book of Judges, they're gone. They made their decision. They lived with the results. 
They've been buried, and now we've got their story so that we don't repeat the same mistakes, right? And so if you remember in our introduction to the book of Judges, we said that the book of Judges, or we said that the book and its application is all about uh, real estate and gaining ground. Do you remember that? So this book is all about real estate and gaining ground. This book is also about war. It's about war. And like the Israelites, we must battle for the things that God gave us. So some people don't like to think of it that way. They think that if I become a Christian, I pull out my recliner, it's all over, man. It's just rest. It's easy street from here. Not at all. Not at all. So a veteran will tell you, a veteran who's been in combat, will tell you that war is hell. I think it was MacArthur or Patton that said that. War is... Somebody who's never been in war says, Oh man, I got the black ops... Five, man, and me and my friends, pa, 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 pa. hey, love you, get out of the way. I hear my son all the time from his room all the way across, right? Just, Shut up! War is exciting when you're playing it on a video game. But if you've ever been to combat, and I've counseled with men who've been in combat, they'll tell you war is hell. How much like hell? So much, Mario, I don't even want to tell you all the details. I got a buddy of mine, he comes here once a while. I love him to death. He has PTSD like you would not believe. He was a gunner on a tank. He used to shoot a 50 caliber. He told me that one morning there was some people running. He didn't know who they were, but he wasn't about to take any chances. He shot a guy right here. He said his body twisted, his upper part of the body twisted like this. When they drove the tank over, he says that his waist was about the size of a silver dollar. These are the kinds of things that veterans have seen that they don't often talk about. Right? And then there's the children and the, and, and the women that get caught in the mix and they're victims. Right? War is hell. Nobody likes war. But be encouraged because in this war, if you're in this war, if you've signed on, okay, if you're in this war, you have the high privilege of being in the presence of God. In Judges chapter 1 verse 2, it says, The Lord said, Judah shall go up. And then he says, Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. God was present with Judah. Verse 4, Then Judah went up and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. The Lord was present. Verse 19, it says, So the Lord was with Judah. Three times in one chapter, God confirms His presence will be with those who are fighting in the battle. Well, Mario, I'm afraid to fight. I don't know if I even want to go with you to Simi Valley. I mean, you're talking about me getting attacked if I go out there and try to win souls. I don't know if I want to do that. Well, then you're not... I don't want to... I don't want to offend anybody. <clears throat> but if that's not the case, you signed on for the wrong thing. Because if you're a Christian, you are a soldier in God's army. Period. End of story. Bad things are going to happen to you. There's just no other way around it. And I'm not talking about the self-destructive nature that we have. I'm, you, that, yeah, you, you do stupid things, you're going to get stupid results. But I'm talking about the enemy coming at you. And you'll know it when you experience it. It's things going on, but you can feel this dark cloud that is also present. And you know. And, and, and you experience the fear and you get down on your knees and God help me, I don't know what's going on. It's like an exorcism here, right? It happens. But listen, God is present with the New Testament people too. In Romans chapter 8 verse 31, He says, If God is with us, who can be against us? So He's present with you. You need not fear. Fear is optional, right? So what is our war? We're not the Israelites. Hey, we're almost done. But what is our war? And what are we fighting for? And what are we fighting against? Well, first, we fight an inner battle that the Bible calls a war with our flesh. A war with our flesh. If you've been in recovery, you talk about the disease. All right? The disease would be something similar to what the Bible calls the flesh. Right? So Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 20 describes that war. Okay? Listen to this. 
This is the war that you're engaged in. And I got this out of the Message Bible. The English is a little bit more clear. He says, he, he calls it like this. <clears throat> Trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all consuming yet never satisfied wants. A brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrollable and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. That is the flesh that you and I are battling against. That's ugly, man. That is some dark, wicked, ugly stuff. This war against the flesh is going to be won or lost depending on what you fill your mind with. There is the Bible, and then there's everything else. But how about my therapist, Mario? Well, I hope you're seeing your therapist, I don't know, an hour a week, and you're into the Bible, I don't know, 36 hours a week, I hope. Well, what about my meetings, Mario? Well, what about your meetings? I hope you're in the Bible more than you are in meetings. I hope. Well, what about, I don't know, whatever, my exercise program? Well, physical exercise is good. It profits little, the Bible says, Right? Mark left already. <laughs> the Bible says it profits a little, right? But the Word of God. If you're filling your mind up with the Word of God, the war against your flesh is going to be lost. So listen, I, I believe in the 12 steps. I love that method because it brings clarity to my character defects. It shows me how my flesh is operating in such a real way. And then I can begin to pray about it so God can make a difference in my life, right? So I'm, 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 I'm down with that. I'm, I'm all good with that, right? Um. But that only allows me to see them. Now I need change. I don't want to just look at my character defects. And because I'm going to start to focus on them. And when I focus on them, my focus becomes a magnifying glass. And pretty soon I'm screaming insanity because I keep doing this and I keep doing this and I keep doing this and I can't stop. What's the problem? I'm focused on the character defects. If I was focused here, if I took Jesus with me everywhere that I went, my focus would be on Him, and all that stuff is just going to melt away. You'll lose the desire, you'll lose the temptation. It's an amazing thing that will happen. There will be a war, but you will be strong enough to turn left when the flesh is saying turn right. You'd be strong enough to keep your mouth shut when the flesh says, let them have it. <laughs> right? You won't fight for parking spots no more. You won't flip nobody off on the free. I'm sure nobody does it here. The people out there. Right? <laughs> You'll just put all of that down. But the moment that you're focused on the character defects and those things, they become magnified and they begin to take over. We're almost done. Second, there is an outward battle. And that outward battle is a battle. It's a war for lost souls. And so where Israel's war was physical, ours is spiritual. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And so it's interesting that both battles, the inner battle and the outward battle, must be fought at the same time because the rulers of darkness and those spiritual hosts have confused a lost world so much that unless they see the victory over chaos in our own lives... They are not likely to believe what we say. They are not likely to want what we have. Why would they? Why would they? I don't blame them for that. Right? So in closing, let me just say that if you're in a place of compromise with your flesh and your character defects, your inner war, 
Or if you're presently living with the results of your past compromise, it's okay because the war is not over. You can get up and you can fight on. But please take these next verses to heart. You need to know the nature of the next verse, the voice of God in these verse, verses. Because if you're not, you're going to think that God is no longer for you, that He's against you. And that is not the case. When you read the Bible, you're going to hear God yelling at you and bashing you and screaming you. No, no, that's not true. Those are the voices in your head because you've allowed so much junk to come into here that all you can do is see God through the lenses of that junk. But God loves you. And He's for you, not against you. In Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, it says, Then the angel of the Lord, I can't get into that now, but it's Jesus Christ. It's a Christophany. Look, Google it. <laughs> then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bacham and said, Now he's speaking to his people. I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. I'm the one who brought you out of your addiction of cocaine and heroin and pornography, says God. Right? And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. I've been with you then, I'm with you now the same way. And you shall make no covenants with the inhabitants of this land. You should not compromise with your enemies. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you. But they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. I'm not punishing you, God says. But unless I leave you to the results of compromise with your enemy, you're never going to learn. So I'm going to leave you in the fire a little longer, because it's going to bring the maturity that you need, right? So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voices and they wept. Then they called the name of that place Bacham, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. And when Joshua had dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. So in verse chapter or verse one, he said, "This is he gives them a reminder of his consistent love and faithfulness." Sometimes we forget if we're not in the Word and we're just focused on our stuff. We forget that the same God who began with us is going to continue with it. You and I are fickle. We change our mind all the time. He does not, right? And so if you look back, you'll see that God has been and therefore will continue to be loving and faithful to you. Verse 2, the Lord said, why have you done this? This was not said in anger. This is God speaking with his broken, shattered heart in his hand. Why? Have you done this? It hurts me so much to watch you destroy yourself. It hurts me so much to watch you not progress, but your flesh just is kicking your butt from that side of the room to the other side of the room. And it's breaking my heart because I have something so much better for you, right? And verses 4 and 5, this is where we got to be. The people get honest. Notice, they don't say, I didn't do that. That's not what I did. I, he was the one who wanted to compromise, not me. And I haven't even touched the tax money. It wasn't me. They're not in denial. They get honest with God. They express regret. It says that they wept. And then most importantly, they repented and they continued in battle. They continued in battle. At the end of the story, we know they got that little piece, but at least they got a piece. They continued in battle. And that's where we have to be. We're engaged in a war. And we have to commit to a war against the flesh and character defects. And we have to saturate our minds with God's Word. I am so proud of Anthony and Eli and Jeff and Greg as we get together once a week in that school of, of Bible study, theology, and ministry. And we talk about things that are deep, man, and where we're going. And our minds, we're starting to think alike. And you know who we're starting to think like? Like Jesus. Together, we support each other. Sometimes one of us will rebel. And in that conversation, before it's over, say, wow. 
I can't believe I was all the way over there, man. Yeah, it happens like that. And we're starting to think the same. And the women who are meeting at Camille's uh, group, you guys are invited to do that if you're a woman. They're doing the same thing. They're studying out of a book. And I'm just watching things form. and t- I just Because it's not me and it's not Camille. It's the Lord. And we stand back, do what He tells us to do, and we watch and say, Wow, look at that beautiful flower that's blossoming. Am I causing it to blossom? No, the Lord is. And it's an incredible thing. And what we have now is a team. We have a team of people that are communicating in God's language together. Now that we have a team, we're able to go out and hopefully conquer some other land. Take some more real estate. I like real estate, right? So with that said, you guys, we are done.